on this computer. Hello, everyone. Welcome to A Breath of Fresh Career. Justin Kane, the host. I'm joined here on episode season one, episode nine with, with George Stella. George is the chief revenue officer for a company by the name of Big Token. George, uh, father, the last time he and I did a video, he had four kids. Now he's got six. He's just popping them out over there. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, world known surfer. This guy has been the New York State surf champion uh, several times. He's a pioneer in shopper marketing technology, and I'm psyched to have him. You got the beanie on for those of, for those of you tuning in on YouTube. Um, yo, before we even start talking about Big Token, first of all, how are you? And tell me about, you, you have twins now, brand new babies. Brand new babies, yep. It's, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, the I threw the beanie on there last minute when I saw how slick you looked and I had to figure something out. I had to figure something out to keep up. But yeah, it's kind of cool. I have a pretty wide spread. I just dropped uh, one kid off at college freshman year and then turned around, came home to newborn twins. So um, it's pretty exciting. Six kids, just keeping it, keeping, keeping it real, keeping it young, having fun. And you live, and you live on Long Island. I do. And, or as I like to say, wrong in the surfing world, wrong island. <laughs> you live on the wrong island. So, yo, hang on, though. A lot of people, and I didn't know this, um, but Long Island's got a pretty, pretty sick surf community. Um, obviously, different kind of waves than, than the West Coast, right? But, like, tell us about, first of all, tell us about surfing in February off of Long Island. Like, yo, I, I consider myself pretty hard doing cold showers, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of stuff like that. But how the heck do you mentally jump into the ocean, you know, in February? Like, you got to be nuts, man. Like, that's just, that's great. Really hard. So tell us, tell us a little bit about surfing off Long Island, please. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, Long Island surfers are definitely a different breed. You know, it's, it's, surfing is such a, such a passion. And to live in New York and be a surfer, if you're, if you're keeping it real, you're not a you know a, a, a poser surfer or a fake surfer you to get good experiences uh you gotta you gotta be willing to go in the water in february when it's 25 degrees out and the north winds at you know 15 to 20 miles an hour you're freezing throw on a bunch of 20 pounds of rubber and uh and go in the water so you know, it, it's definitely, it keeps, uh, it's a whole different tone of surfing. I definitely had to get away from it and, and move to some warm climates over my younger years, which I did, but coming back to New York, um, I love it. That's love awesome, it. man. You, you, you know, talking about that, and I want to learn how you got your start in surfing, but you actually lived in Hawaii at one point in your life, right? So I did, you know, I don't do I'm a hockey guy. We we've talked surfing. We've talked shark bombs. We've talked the whole deal. I, uh, this is for joking. Um, no, you're not, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but I've heard the stories about like, you know, territory and pecking order. Like you, you got a New Yorker, you know, moving to Hawaii. How'd you, how'd you get, how'd you work your way in out there? Like what's, this, is it, is that real? Like the pecking order and the territories and, you know, you can only surf in certain spots. And it's real. I mean, it was a lot worse when I was there, the late 80s, mid, late 80s, early 90s. Um, it was interesting because, you know, I learned, well, I, was, I was a Howley. It's what they call white people out there. It's what they used to call white people out there, and they kind of still do. Um, and there's a whole mindset out there. It was much worse then. It's getting a lot better now. Of Like, you know, the Hawaiians, that's their land. That's their territory. That's their sovereign land. And all these white people are coming in uh, and taking over their surf spots and their paradise. And it was really interesting for me, actually, during those times, because um, when I look back, like, I actually learned what it was like to be discriminated against. Um, I learned what it was like to be a minority. I used to try and surf these spots, these local spots that the Hawaiians supposedly owned and would get chased out, ch chased away, get rocks thrown at me. Right. And, um, it was cool. So I kind of learned that perspective, but over time, 
um, I figured out that if you were, if you showed a mutual respect and, and you, and you listened to their perspective and you, and you communicated your perspective that you could come to this kind of mutual, mutual respect, mutual understanding. And that was a great lesson for me in, in my early days. Wow, man, that's deep, dude. That is, <laughs> that is, that is Truth. a lot deeper. Uh, it comes down to respect. So it's not like just hopping on this board and showing these guys that you can surf, you know, these big ass waves on the North shore of Hawaii. Um, it's, it's, it's respect. It's, it's respecting them and respecting, you know, their waters. Essentially. It is. And, but at the same time, like, you don't want to condone getting rocks thrown at you. So you want them to respect you as well and understand your side. And then, you know, everybody has a mutual situation going. Yeah. It's yeah. a good life lesson. How'd you start? How'd you start off surfing, dude? Like, how'd you get kids? From um, like what? What's yeah. I mean, I grew up, I mean, you think of when you think New York, New York city, you don't think surfing, but long Island's got a hundred miles of coastline on the Atlantic. I grew up on the beach right outside of New York city. Um, my dad was a surfer. He was one of the first, if not the first surfers on long Island wow. pioneering back in the, in the early fifties. So, um, just kind of got exposed to it at a super early age Been doing it since I was probably five. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, do your kid now six kids, obviously the two babies don't surf yet, but to, to some of the yeah. older surf? Yeah, my son. So I have the two twins are boys. I have three and then and then I have three daughters and a son. So the son, he's 14 now. He surfs with me all the time. Awesome. The girls can surf. They don't think it's cool. They will one day. Um, but you know, dad does it, so maybe it's lame. But everybody can surf. But the son is is obsessed. So uh, what's I got that uh, what's that female, what's that that girl uh, surf movie, Blue Crush? Oh, yeah. You gotta have That's him watch that. It'll be cool. Oh, they've watched it. Yep. I'm sure. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right. So let's get into, let's get into business. Um, big token. So tell us what big token is and, and what you guys do. Um, you know, big token is what I, what we believe is the next generation data system. You know, um, i our industry has been, reliant on uh, a, a system of data that, that relies heavily on, on third party data collection and walled gardens. And it's a really, it's been a really challenging space uh, for marketers and researchers and insight folks and all these organizations to work within. Big Token believes that if you allow consumers to create and own their own data, their own, and, and share their personal information in a way that they can control it, um, can control who has access to it, and be placed in the value exchange for it, that that creates a much more accurate, um, a much more accurate base of, uh, or consumer graph or set of data for for our industry to work within so big token you know we created this this platform it's an application it's available on the app store and google play go download it um, and it gives you the ability as a consumer to come in and create your own data in a variety of ways you you're answering questions and surveys but you're also connecting all the things that you already do in your digital lives that create data anyway um, like connecting your bank accounts and your credit cards and your loyalty programs, um, connecting social networks, right? And so now all of this data is coming through the Big Token platform. And as the user, you are controlling it and getting paid for it. And so it benefits the consumer and it also benefits the brands and the organizations that are activating against it because they're now activating against a set of consumers that are philosophically aligned with with sharing their information. Um, and so it just becomes a more accurate um, and robust, you know, environment to, to, to work within. So, so let me just back you up for one second. So we're at the beach, we're hanging out, you're, you're surfing, you're a badass surfer. And I'm sitting over there and I'm like, aside from shredding waves, if that's what you guys call it in the surfing world, what do you do? Like, Give me the, the 101A level. You're talking to some guy you don't even know that doesn't even know technology. 
and how does it benefit the consumer? Are you telling me that essentially your technology gives me as a consumer ownership of my data and allows me to share my data with marketers of my choice? So sur surfing marketers, if I'm into surfing, um, and then, then, then in turn, I get compensated for the use of my data. Is that what you're telling me? Basically, yes. I mean, the way I explain it to, to, to the, you know, folks that, that aren't in our industry is I say, you know, don't you know that everything you do already in your life creates data for these organizations? When you're on Facebook, when you're shopping with your credit card, when you're moving around the world with your mobile device, when you walk into a doctor's office, everything we're doing as consumers today, unless you live on the top of Mount Fuji and you're completely unplugged, everything you do from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep, and even while you're asleep, I happen to have a sleep number bed that knows my heart rate and all, everything you do in your life creates data. And whether you realize it or not, you are agreeing when you're downloading an application on your device or when you're setting up your television or when you're setting up your new sleep number bed. You're agreeing in the fine print to share all of this information with these companies. And these companies are making a billion dollars off that. Don't you want to get in? Don't you realize that you own that information and it's worth at this point, pound for pound, worth more than oil? Don't you want to get compensated for that? Don't you want to be in that value exchange? Don't you want a piece of that? And so what Big Token does is it allows you to get into the game, to put skin in the game. Take control back of your information, control it in this application, pick which organizations you want to be allowed access to your, what basically what it comes down to is your identity, your sovereign identity and then get paid for it as they, as they activate against, against it and be aligned with the things that you're seeing on a daily basis from advertisers, marketers, websites, brands. Et cetera. That's, you know, that's, yeah. it's, it, that's it in a nutshell, yeah. Wow, man, that's, that's big. And obviously with all the compliance issues that are, you know, that we're facing right now and or marketers and brands are facing with regards to GDPR and the California Consumer Protect Protection Act, this is essentially not, I don't want to say a workaround, but this is, uh, it's an this answer. Is, this it's is an the, answer to it. This is the answer the to response. It. it. Exactly. It's a bridge into the future, into the future that is surrounded by things like that regulation, rise in consumer sentiment. Hey, I want to get paid for my data. Right. Wow. And then with all of that, it solves the accuracy, third party data system accuracy, what I call legacy data system dilemma that our industry has struggled with for years. So now this we think we got something here. Yeah, I think so too. Based I'm gonna sign up for for big token. I think when I when you first did it, we're gonna get into you guys coming from another organization and kind of spinning off. If you don't mind, we'll talk a little bit about that and why. But you know, you being kind of like the, the brainchild, the, um, uh, yeah, I'd say the brainchild and shopper marketer, shopper marketing, right? I mean, this, or not brainchild, but I should say you kind of being a pioneer in shopper marketing, right? And, and one of the guys that really got behind shopper marketing technology from the previous organizations you worked for, um, this was kind of like, you had a big part in, in developing Big Token, if I remember correctly, right? Yourself. Yeah, I mean, so I can't take, I can't take the credit for coming up with the idea. Um, a good friend and former colleague of mine named Chris Nelson was the brainchild of, of Big Token as, as, as a consumer application. Um, he came up with the idea. Uh, he, he's since, you know, he's, he was a big part of what's gotten us to where we are now and has since exited the company. He's actually gone on to Facebook to create their uh, consumer privacy um, initiatives and products. So really excited for him. He's taken, he's taken this thing to, you know, what, 6 billion people across the globe. Um, but I, I um, as he created it, I, I 
sort of orchestrated the commercial side of the business. So I figured out how to make money off it, Got it. which uh, at the end of the day is pretty important. <laughs> <laughs> it's why pretty, we're here it's pretty important it's why we're here so tell us tell the listeners and myself about srax s-r-a-x slash big token previous year previous years and then why you guys decided to become your own entity and what that means for for, for big token going forward yeah i mean so srax is a publicly traded company been around around been around for about 10 years um has created a bunch of these different, you know, data driven marketing technology platforms, big token being one of them. I think that we recognized pretty early on that big token was kind of very special and maybe like the one to go, um, to go all the way. And so uh, it was important to get it spun off onto its own, which we just did. Um, it's now its own, uh, as of probably around December 1st will be its own publicly traded entity. Uh, so that, you know, us as an organization now, big token being, um, can really just focus on, on the big token business, um, and, and just focus on, you know, growing it and, and pushing it forward. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. What, um, 2020, right. What a crazy year. Crazy. Continue to, we continue to see craziness as we speak. We're still undecided with the election. Um, what are your plans to expand in 2021? What, what's the plan once you guys do get that public offering and, and, and go live with this? You know, we just have to continue to innovate. You know, we've been extremely disruptive with our story. Um, so it's just keep, keep that storytelling going in an innovative way. It's funny when I look at, late 2019 telling the big token story was very disruptive almost so much that you know it was hard to get brands and other companies to kind of adopt um and now i look i look back eight months later and it's 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 way less disruptive than it was then as the industry is catching up so you know, going into 2021, just continue to stay ahead of the trends, identify the trends, keep just, you know, really focusing on what's best for the consumer is, you know, if we keep focusing on, on how to serve our, the consumer side, our, our, our customers in the app, um, then, you know, everything else we, we, we believe will kind of follow that. Got it. Okay. So you, you've actually noticed that the industry based on 2019 to 2020, through this pandemic has essentially played catch up to what you guys do. How has your approach different, uh, uh, changed, excuse me, and become different here in 2020 to selling this solution, selling the idea, telling the story. Um, and, and obviously how has the reception of your offering changed from the customer? It's interesting, you know, as we, as we moved into this pandemic that nobody really expected, or obviously nobody could could have anticipated. Um, we were just picking up steam and we were out there telling our story and then the pandemic hit early mid-March and we realized very quickly that um, we would just have to keep telling the story, in fact, doubling down on the story because uh, if you think about it, we have, I don't know, we're up to about 6 million plus consumers in the United States on our application that are in the app answering questions, doing all these things that we have this one-to-one -one relationship with. And so as the consumer landscape is so drastic, drastically shifting and changing as, as these insane market conditions um, evolve, because we're having these one-to-one -one dialogues and, and relationships with our consumers, we're able to stay ahead or understand in real time what the consumer changes are. So we allow our brand partners to understand literally real time shifts in consumer behavior and consumer activity, and then allow them to quickly, you know, activate against those shifts in real time. So it's, it's really what's helped us is the big token story and doubling down on it.
That's awesome. I mean, you hear these stories about some organizations that are absolutely struggling, circling the drain during this, during this time. And a lot of us with the unknown, especially in, you know, March, April time, time frame, we were just hunkering down buying toilet paper and paper towel in bulk. Um, and, uh, and, and big token knew that, that consumers were going to be buying paper towels and toilet paper. And we, we allowed, you know, the Georgia Pacifics of the world to react and make more toilet paper. That's awesome. It, no, it really is. It, yeah. it, it really is simple. For, and fortune, great. fortune teller, uh, future fortune teller. So let's leave big token. Let's put that aside really quickly. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about you getting your start in technology because a breath of fresh career is about, you know, sharing stories, uh, with our listeners to, you know, help them, you know, figure, figure some things out in the tech sector. T tell us how you got your start in technology. <laughs> technology. Um, I don't really consider myself a technologist. Um, I've always been on the sales side, more of a storyteller. Um, but to be honest with you, for me, and, and this may not be the greatest answer for this show, but it was out of necessity, I guess you can say. We talked about it in the beginning, surfer, living in Hawaii. It came down to one day I, you know, I turned around and I had to grow up and, uh, I had to figure out what to do. And, you know, my dad was in the media business forever. He was, um, aside from being a surfer, he was, uh, he worked for, you know, NBC and a bunch of these big media companies in the early days as a, as a, a advertising sales guy. And I was like, Hey, let me try that. So he got me, um, you know, an entry level job at one of the TV, th one of the TV, you know, companies. And, and I was like a sales assistant for, you know, selling TV airtime, um, cut my teeth there, wound up at Comedy Central way early on when, when like, you know, cable was on the rise. That was like the big, uh, we were still, still telling, selling 30 second spots, but it was like cable now instead of TV. And like South, South Park was, was like getting a point, you know, three rating and that was incredible. Um, and from there, uh, early 99, I recognized that, um, that the industry was shifting or was very likely to shift into this new big explosion called the internet. And so I jumped over there and, and so, you know, the rest is kind of history. A deeper dive once you got on the internet side. Deeper dive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Such a, what, um, getting in, you know, by the way, sales and surfing, both in your DNA from your father, which is huge. Um, Getting into, I, I'll call it technology, man. Like, you know, you went from Comedy Central selling, you know, ads to, to you know, regional sales director at 24-7 Real Media at the time. Um, and, and a bunch of other companies. Um, what do you wish you had known when you started out in this business? Knowing what you know now. Uh, that's a good question. Um... I would say it would have been helpful to understand that there would be all of these massive shifts um, in, in, in market conditions as we moved through um, early 2000s and then, you know, all the way up to now, um, massive shifts that, you know, created a wave of companies that would disappear and a whole new wave of companies to come in. Um, we saw companies that remained innovative. I think they were probably in the minority, but the companies that remained innovative um, continued to win. And the ones that couldn't innovate and stay ahead of the trends um, died. Um, and, you know, so I guess that's my answer there. And, you know, we're in, we're in a massive one now. So how, how do you, how do you identify an innovative company? How, how would you do it? A company that, um, you know, allows, allows its, its people to, to blossom with ideas, you know, companies that don't lead with control, but rather lead with, um, with, I guess what I'd say context, you know, and just, allowed allowed their people to remain 
you know, flexible and, and give them the ability to just come up with, with ideas and, and continue to, to innovate and, and just listen, you know, don't be rigid. Don't be, um, stay humble. Don't think, you know, everything, understand that you probably know very little, um, and just keep listening, keep, stay open. Okay. You, um, I gave you some questions, you know, for this, this interview that, that we'd kind of rattle off and, and I'm going to jump around a little bit because it plays in directly to what we were just talking about. But what are you curious about right now? What are you seeing in the industry? What's next? What do you think is coming? That's, that's next. Is it, I like to call it conversational commerce where, you know, you know, your refrigerator, you know, tells Amazon that you're, you're low on eggs and milk and it just shows up at your door the next day. I mean, like what, you know, what are you seeing that's exciting you? Yeah. I mean, I think the important things right now to, to keep it real for a second, um, some, some very, very important things in the, in the consumer data space and, and, and overall are really looking at, especially in digital advertising piece of it is looking at what's going to happen to, to cookies. That's, that's an obvious one, right? It looks more and more like we're heading into a, a cookie list future. So what do the protocols look like for marketers and researchers and, you know, measurement companies, what are the protocols in order for us to be able to continue to, to speak to consumers, track and target advertising? Um, we're going to have to figure out a way to, to resolve consumers' identities, um, or we won't be able to, to track and target them anymore. And that really actually plays into the Big Token story, so we're really excited about it, because Big Token is all about allowing mass number of consumers to create their own sovereign I identifications, you know, and control them. And it's the companies, I believe, the brands, the organizations that have these one-to-one -one relationships with large numbers of consumers and their sovereign IDs with a permission-based you know, permission structure are, are the ones that are, that are going to be able to survive the, uh, as we move into this cookie-less environment. So I think that's the biggest thing we're, that we should be looking at. That's, that's really, that's really important. I mean, like, I don't know how some of these marketers are going to operate if they're not staying ahead of that wave, the tie right. surfing into it, you know, what, yeah. um, what, uh, um, you, you're in a position as a chief revenue officer to do some hiring you've hired in the past. We've actually converted on a couple, which is great. What, what, um, Let's talk about some of the key characteristics you look for when you're interviewing candidates, because needless to say, dude, there are a lot of people out there looking right now. Um, you guys have a very, very unique offering. So like, what's going to pop out? What's going to hop out to you? Some, some of the folks that I asked that question to were like, you know, I like it when somebody reaches out before the interview and introduces themselves to me and, you know, says that they're looking forward to doing, you know, doing this interview and, and they've taken a look at my background and they know other companies like Hook Logic and Owner IQ and the bot. And, oh, I know, you know, Lauren Slutsky over at Yieldbot. Yield um, uh, so, so what, um, what, uh, what do you look for? Like, how, how do people stand out to you? I think, uh, I think I'm a different kind of hirer. Um, and it's, I'd say, and this goes for, you know, the more important the role is to the organization, the more kind of senior role, um, the more I look for a specific, there's always some specific kind of, and you and I talk about this a lot when we, uh, you know, when we do work together, there's always a specific kind of, I guess you'd say X factor. That is that you look for from specific role to specific role. Right. So I, I always kind of look for that, that one X factor that's going to make this individual be as effective in this role as they can be. Um, another thing, and this, this is, this may sound funny, but I'm dead serious here. Like no jerks, no, um, you know, no, no jerks that think they know everything. Um, it's important that people are humble. That's, that's a big one for me. 
uh, it's important that people know how to keep things. And you and I talk about this one too. It's important that people know how to keep things simple, right? Um, it's important. Yeah. I mean, just keep things simple. Um, you don't always have to show that you are the smartest guy in the room and you can use the biggest words and talk for, you know, the most amount of time. Keep, be smart, be a, but keep things, you know, know how to keep things simple. Um, and I think looking for, for mature sort of grownups, and I don't say that to say I'm looking for people that are older. I, I look for people that no matter what age you are, you're grown up, you're mature, you can take context as a leadership style as opposed to control. So if you're given the correct concept, context in an organization, you're, you're able to make the right decisions following the vision as opposed to somebody that needs, um, you know, control measures on a daily basis. I'm, wow. I hate being micromanaged. I hate micromanaging. That's, that's the way I hire. That's awesome. What now when you, okay. You, you, you get a candidate who's actually, you know, submitted to you by, by somebody like me or, or they send you their resume or you get introduced to somebody. Are you looking at resumes? You looking at LinkedIn, you looking at both, you know, what is important for you to see in that profile? I scan resumes, you know, not super important. Everything's on LinkedIn these days. So it's, it's really mostly LinkedIn. And when I'm looking through stuff, especially on LinkedIn, you know, people kind of have the ability to express things in LinkedIn about themselves and about the, how they look at the, their respective industries and how they, what they think their respective roles are. Um, and so when I look through that language, you know, kind of connected to what we just talked about a minute ago, I just look for simple language. You know, I look for people that know what they're talking about in a, in a simple way to get it across, you know, good communicators that get it across in a simple way, not the language and content that make it apparent that they're just trying to be the smartest guy in the room. Um, you know, folks that are, that are good communicators and, and just know how to be smart, innovative in, in, in a simple way. Yeah. Humble, smart. Humble is very important. Community. Okay. Wow. Communicate. So, so LinkedIn being a social with air quotes around my head, right? Social for those of you not looking on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn is essentially a social network. I mean, for professionals are, do you leverage any other social networks? Do you look at Facebook? Do you look at uh, Instagram? I mean, like TikTok is, is huge these days. Make a TikTok. Maybe. Um, maybe. Yeah. Nah. Um, maybe. Um, but what I'd say, you know, the advice I give is like, if you're anybody, I say this to my kids, um, before you post stuff, like just run a simple test in your mind. Like, is this something I would want an employer to see is this something i would want a teacher um, a, a client a, a prospective client to see yeah. ever um and if the answer is no then it's probably not a good idea to post it <laughs> pretty pretty basic right? pretty basic stuff absolutely i you know my instagram <laughs> is all surfing i just keep it i keep it you know clean you um if, uh, you, you said your son is 14 right so our son eli is 13 and and Dude, the, you know, his whole team is on Snapchat because that's kind of like how they, they, they use Snapchat as like a text, text group. Like, Hey, I'm at the oh, rink. Course. This is exactly. where we are picture, right. you know? Um, and he put a funny picture of like his face and I'm like, before you hit send on that, dude, do you want to, do you want people, somebody could take a screenshot of that dude. And that's out there somewhere, you know, like that funny picture of your face. Do you want like a p potential or prospective college hockey coach or, dean of schools to find that somewhere out there when you were 13 years old like come on like always represent yourself the best that you possibly can you know hence the beanie um there it is you know you know i know i'm thinking to myself do i 
do I really want employers and, and prospective clients to see me sitting here in a beanie? And I don't know what the answer is, honestly. We may have to go over and, and redo this. <laughs> we, I can just edit no, just it. Put a nice you can edit it out, put like a... <laughs> <laughs> like an ice cream cone. Yeah, put a frog sitting on your head. Um, <laughs> man, a breath of fresh career. It's about career. It's about a new perspective. You shared a lot. What advice can you give our listeners? Life, work, entrepreneurship, et cetera, like surfing. What, what advice can you, I mean, you've got a very extensive background. You're very established in the industry. Hit us with some advice right now. Stay humble, um, but stay disruptive as much as you can. You know, stay ahead, continue to disrupt, but do it in a in a, in a in an interesting in, in a simple kind of storytelling way. You know, always be able to communicate um, and and be interesting, but keep things simple. Nobody wants to be bogged down. Be the most interesting with man deeper in the world. dives. Be yeah. Be nope. the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> well, you can be the most interesting man in the world, but don't do it, you know, in a six hour uh, soliloquy with, you know, the, the biggest words and, and, you know, with deeper dives. We've all been there. We have certainly been there. <laughs> yes. We, yeah. <laughs> that's good advice, man. That's, that's good about, that's good advice. I always tell people, man, if you know, cause, cause you know, a breath of fresh career has kind of come about from a breath of fresh air, right? We all know that, that saying. And people are like, man, Justin, you are a breath of fresh air with regards to recruiting, like your energy. And, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, right? But like, oh, I, just, I would, you know, I would agree. I would absolutely you. agree with that. I appreciate you saying that. No, I, uh, I, I tell them straight up. I said, dude, if you, if you can't have fun doing what you're doing, what you're doing, like, don't, don't do it. Like change, change what you're doing because life is short, man. And I, dude, I get up every single morning. You're out on the surfboard with 20 pounds of rubber on you, as you said, um, catching waves in Long Island, but uh, off of Long Island. But you know, I'm working out in the gym. You know, I, I you know, I, that's how I get my day going. And I, I go, I show up to work. I cannot wait to get here. Like I cannot wait to get into work and start just cranking the phone. I love it. I love talking to people. I love building relationships with people like yourself and, 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 and getting to know, getting to know, you know, from a, from, I like taking that deeper dive and getting to know, getting to know somebody from, from the inside out, because that, that's, what's going to allow me to, you know, find you the type of people that are going to work well and gel well with you, um, as, as their boss. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's big and, and it's really cool for you to kind of share your perspective on, what matters and and where the industry is going because that's going to help people uh you know direct them to you know where they think the industry is going as well i mean you never know people don't know about big token you know the first the first week we launched a breath of fresh career over 200 people listened to it in the first week i can't wow. talk to that many people in a week so like big tokens getting some rep right now is there anything Solid. what were you going to say Oh, said solid. That's, that's good. Solid. Yeah. Let's, you know, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Is there anything and anything else I should have asked you and didn't? You should have asked me about my stunt, my, my brief stunt career. What the, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, it's for another, whole another show. Well, we'll um, have you back on, but yo, you were a stunt man. I did a brief stint as a water stunt guy. Um, one movie being Titanic, but again, that's for another day. What? No, dude, we're on right now. This is Listen, it. Listen, tell, tell, hit us with, get it, give us accomplished, a little Well, grew up on the beach, you know, was an ocean lifeguard for many years, a, a, you know, seasoned surfer, um, uh, right out of college, San Diego state was trying to, still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Kind of lucked into, uh, you know, a couple of my buddies were working as city of San Diego lifeguards. And, and at the time, this, these, these dudes from, from uh, uh, Paramount Pictures were looking for a crew of water safety people to work on this movie they were filming the down, the in, Titanic. They down in Rosarito, Mexico, which happened to be the Titanic. So they brought us, they brought us down. 
uh, and they were like, wow, you guys are pretty strong in the water. And the next thing you know, we were acting as, um, as water stunt guys on, on, on the Titanic. So can you actually uh, see George Stell in the Titanic somewhere? You can, if you watch the movie frame by frame, you can see me for a split second towards the end. Okay. Okay. That's all you're going to say. Well, I mean, if you want specifics, there's, there's the scene where, where the Billy Zane character is like trying to get away from, from the sinking ship in a lifeboat. Um, yes. And you can see me trying to climb up into the lifeboat and Billy Zane just goes wham and whacks me in the head with an oar and I go flying backwards. I remember that. That was you. There you go. That was me. Damn. And the little girl he was holding was actually the uh, the the stunt the stunt double for the little girl was that character. Um, he was a. Uh, I'm trying to think of the politically correct word here. Dwarf. That's in uh, Willy Wonka. The little guy with the red hair. Oh. was the stunt double so that was i'll never forget that it was fun oh that my was funny. god that's that funny that's incredible learn something new every day man he was a diva that little guy was a diva really he was like where's my sushi <laughs> like we don't have sushi we just have spaghetti Lumpa -lumpa. <laughs> yeah. um how do you want listeners to connect with you email linkedin instagram how do you want how do you want linkedin's LinkedIn's always great. I mean, I'm like always on, I'm always checking everything. I, I think LinkedIn is good. Um, Instagram's actually fun too, you know, if it's done appropriately. Okay. Um, you know, I'll try so, yeah. to, I'll open an Instagram account. I think I've got one and I'll, ch I'll, I'll put a link to that in your LinkedIn profile uh, and all the information um, when, when, when this thing goes live. Excellent. Yeah. Dude, that's it. That's all I got for you, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, we'll do this again. We'll Let's do this go. again. All right. So that's appreciate it, man. It. Um, I appreciate you, George. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Sounds good. Right, Thanks. See you, buddy. Bye. Bye now.